Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, hi, my name is Blaine Butler. I'm a product owner at the Center for Open Science. Uh, Center for Open Science, or COS, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing openness, integrity, and reproducibility in research. Um, we're going to drop a poll just to see how familiar any, everyone is with using the OSF or the Open Science Framework. Um, please uh, take a second to participate. This information is really useful for us in understanding um, how, how familiar you are with uh, what we're introducing today. I see a lot of you have an OSF account. Always good. So, and um, slightly familiar to not that familiar. So, thank you for that. So, um, okay. Okay, so some of the topics we're going to cover today are um, your account and profile, how you can discover content on the OSF, uh, research and planning, so registrations and pre-registrations, study, uh, study management and collaboration, um, handled mostly through OSF projects, uh, research sharing, also handled through OSF um, preprints, and then various relationships, so connected resources across the OSF. So, so um, what is the OSF? The OSF is um, any, and during this presentation, sorry, um, feel free to drop questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, there are a bunch of other people here from Center for Open Science that can help answer those um, while I'm going through this webinar. And this is going to be a hands-on webinar. Um, so I'll be demoing a lot of the things as I'm talking about them. Um, okay, so the OSF or Open Science Framework is a free open source online research platform, which is designed to support researchers um, in openly and transparently sharing their work throughout the research life cycle. Um, those are some of the cures, um, kind of how we imagine the research life cycle where you're searching, developing ideas, designing a study, um, collecting data, analyzing data, interpreting your findings, publishing and writing your reports. So first we're gonna go in and do a sign up. Um, if you do not have an account, you can sign up using this button. Um, you can sign up using your ORCID or your ORC ID or an institution. I am not a member of an institution, so I can't sign in like that. Um, however, I have an account and we'll sign in. If you are a member of an institution and you don't know um, if your institution has an institutional membership, you can simply go to institutions, and you can search. So I went to James Madison. They do have an institutional membership, so I could sign in if I still had access to um, my James Madison uh, email. Okay. So now we're going to go in and do um, we're going to look at how you can discover content. So just last year, we uh, re released some new search uh, functionalities. Um, so we have filters now that allow you to search for various items. So let's say I want to look for um, projects and then funded by the National Institute of Health. So there are 21 projects funded by the NIH. Um, the important thing for this is you can see that these are all public projects 
And all of this was entered in their metadata. Um, so as the person who is the creator of this project, they went in and made sure that they um, entered in their metadata information, including the funder, um, the award number, and then the, any award information. And apparently this also is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, so that's a nice metadata field to, to um, be able to fill in so that people, the public can see who's funding your work. Um, and that's just kind of, uh, we won't get into metadata here, but there's a lot of metadata resources um, within our help guides and within our support page. Okay, you can also um, take this URL and I open a fresh browser. I get the same results. So that's a really nice feature that while you can filter, you can also share this filter or any other filters that you use with others and they'll get the same results that you do. Um, you can also look at registrations. And if the registration potentially has some resources like data, code, materials, papers, or supplements, you can find that. So if I want to find um, registrations that have data associated with them, um, I can also filter by that. So then you have uh, over 490 results where um, registrations have data available. So moving now that we've looked at some registrations, um, let's go into a registration. So I'm here. I'm going to go to OSF registries. Um, I'm going to add a new registration. Um, and just for time's sake, uh, if you have more questions about registrations or which templates to use, um, that's also available in our help guides. Um, and we have uh, product team members who are available that can meet with you and help you um, through this process. So just for time's sake, I'm going to do the open-ended registration. I'm going to say I do not have an OSF project existing that I want to create this from. So I'll start a draft. At this point, if you want to add any other contributors, you can. I'm going to add one of my colleagues. And if you want to double check and make sure if this is the correct person, you can click on the profile. It's not the right person. We're going to try one more. So now I've added one of my other colleagues. Um, you're going to need to choose a license. And I'm just picking architecture. If you have any files associated, you can attach those here.
And so now all of the metadata is filled out, the summary is filled out, you review. Um, to submit this, you would just hit register. I'm not going to do that because I don't actually want to create a registration. So I can just delete the draft. So um, our typical trajectory with writing registrations is you design, conduct, report, and then publish. Um, we also have a uh, registered reports where you can get some peer review in into this workflow. Um, so why should you write a registration or a pre-registration? Um, a registration or a pre-registration is a time-stamped read-only version of the research plan that's created and submitted to a public registry before the study is conducted. Um, this is a way of creating a transparent story of the work you're doing. Um, this story describes what your research plan to do, any updates that need to be made during the study. As we all know, when you're doing research, things change, you learn new things, and you have to adjust what your initial plan was. This is, allows you to a transparent way of um, kind of noting those changes and tracking them throughout the process. Um, we kind of try to think of these as study management plans. You know, you, more and more you're seeing data management plans being required when you're submitting um, for a research project. So this is kind of your study management plan. Um, now we have registrations versus pre-registrations. So um, both uh, pre-registration is kind of done um, during the design period. So can a registration be filled out at the same time. Um, the key factor is that a pre-registration is a type of registration that is completed before the data has been looked at. Um, you can start collecting data, but you can't look at it. That's a very uh, fine line. If you have more questions about that, please reach out. Um, we can help you answer um, and figure out if you're um, if you should be submitting a pre-registration or a registration. Um, so one other thing to note is when you're submitting either a pre-registration or a registration through the OSF, that you can embargo this registration, which means you get to make it private for up to four years. During this period of embargo, um, if you decide that you're ready to make it public, you can. Having your uh, registration or pre-registration embargoed or private means that you can create view only links to it so that people can see an anonymized uh, view of your registration um, as it's private while you're still working on it and creating updates to it. Um, so now we're moving into my, uh, my biggest arena, which is OSF projects. So I'm gonna go. Here. And I'm just going to create a new project. Um, you have the ability to choose various storage locations based on any type of uh, data storage requirements from your funder or your institution. So we have the US. We have Australia, we have Canada and Germany, and Germany is the ad hoc um, storage location for any for most research funders within the EU. It meets all of the um, European Union data storage requirements. However, as I'm in the US, I'm just going to go ahead and choose the United States. And so now I've created a project. I'm going to go to it. Um, you can see that I have an affiliated institution, which is just the Center for Open Science. If I was also at a university or an institution and I had logged in using my institutional credentials, that would also show up. Um, as of right now, my project is private. I have the ability to make it public um, at any time. I can also then, and once it's public, you can create a DOI. I'm not going to do that because this is a, a project I'm going to end up deleting um, as it's just like a test project for this, um, for this webinar. But then I can always go back and make it private again. And you have the ability to do this at any time during 
Um, once you've created your project, you can make it, you can toggle between private and public um, forever. So I'm going to go in and I can once again add more contributors to my project. So, oh, Eric Olson. Um, so right here, this is the Eric Olson who works at Center for Open Science. So I'm gonna add him. And I have the ability to make, um, to give him different permissions. So there's an admin permission, there's read, write, and read. Um, we have uh, explanations within our support center for what these permissions mean. Um, administrator has the uh, top level permissions on a project. They can do everything um, that I'm showing you right now. Um, read, write has the ability to, uh, is a lower level. Basically they can't add um, any other contributors to the project, but they can do editing of the files, um, as well as uh, you know other types of edits to the project. And then there's a read permission, which just means you can view the project. Here's the metadata one that I had mentioned uh, as being really important. Um, I can't, so I can fill out uh, the description, which is always a good thing to do. Um, the contributors are just based upon, um, and you can edit this here too, uh, resource type. So and then you can choose the language. This doesn't actually have any funding or support. You can see your affiliated institutions, let's say, um, I did not want this to be affiliated with my work at the Center for Open Science. I can remove that affiliation. Um, we don't generally recommend that because most of the time your institution is going to want you to share your affiliation. You also have the date created and the date modified. Um, any tags that might enhance um, your uh, people discovering your project. Um, you're also going to want to add a license. If you're not sure which license to use, we have some guidance and help. Um, you can always check with your institution about what's the most appropriate license for your work and who owns the who actually owns the license itself or the rights for the work that is being done. Moving on, we're going to add some components. So. So one of the things um, I like to do is kind of if you're thinking of this as like a research project, you might have a study, you might have multiple studies as part of that. So maybe the first um, component would be study one. Um, you also have the ability which to add the contributors from the uh, initial project and any tags, I don't have any yet, but if you did, So now you'll see that um, this has a lock on it, which means that this component, which is a, basically a sub project of the project or, um, is private. So I can make the test. So I can make all public or I can just make the initial project public, which is what I'm gonna do. Oops. So now this is public and this is private. Um, and I can show you this. So viewing this on a um, different browser where I am not actually um, have access to the project, I can just see the public part of that project. 
However, when I'm actually logged in as an admin on the project, I can also see the private pieces. One of the other things that we have frequently had requests for is looking at how to connect add-ons. So we'll go into some add-ons. Um, we have a few different categories of add-ons. Um, we have storage add-ons, Amazon, uh, Dataverse, Data Hub, Google Drive. We also have some citation um, add-ons, so Mendeley and Zotero. So right now I'm going to connect my Google Drive Um, I actually linked this with my profile. Uh, we can do a demo to show you that later, but basically I'm going to import this where I link it to my Google Drive. Um, I definitely recommend if you're going to be connecting a Google Drive that you create um, a specific folder within your Google Drive that you're going to want to connect for that project specifically. Um, I have a test folder that I always use for when I'm doing demos. Um, so I'm going to connect that one. And you have the same ability with Zotero is there's different libraries within, um, within your potentially Zotero citation manager, and you can collect, you can connect the specific library that you want to utilize. Okay. So now I have a drive connected. We can also upload files. So I have my Google Drive connected and I have all of these files here. So let's say I want to take this picture and move it to um, my OSF file. I can move. can also move files from the overview. So if I want to take this uh, Excel sheet and move it into OSF storage, and now it's in this OSF storage, and it will no longer show up in my Google Drive. I can also add here, yeah. Um, I can add files by dragging and dropping them. So I have a, a WAV file. Uh, we'll drag and drop, and this will now be added to my Google Drive. And then I can also add it to the OSF storage. Um, and for files, there's also the ability to add metadata to files. So So I can edit this metadata, um, maybe your data set up, um, description, data, um, projects. And here I can pick data set, oh wait, whoops. And then this was in. So now I've added um, metadata to my file, which will make it easier for others to utilize it and uh, discover it. I'm also going to add, you can add a file, and I 
I can upload a file just from my computer. Okay, so now we have um, a bunch of different um, files within our project. We have a project, we have a private component. We've linked two add-ons, a Google Drive and a Zotero. Um, one of the final things I guess you can do, or I guess you can do, but you can do when you're doing a research project is you can submit a preprint. I'm going to go to OSF preprints. Um, you can submit a preprint. So uh, OSF has its own preprint service, but we also um, host other uh, preprint providers, um, Ed Archives, Meta Archives, we have Law Archive, um, which is hosted by Yale Library, uh, Sci Archive, Social Archive. Um, I'm going to just utilize OSF preprints because I'm just going to start a preprint. I'm not going to actually submit one because um, once it's submitted, it will get a DOI that you can use as a reference. So again, you can either drag and drop or you can just upload from your computer. Um, I can also select from the existing OSF project, which is what I'm going to do. And you can see that it found, it found the uh, PDF file I have in that project. I'm going to choose that. It's going to give it the title of the project. All right, then you complete your author assertions. Um, I'm going to say yes, there is, because I have a data set. Oh, wait, no. So there's the link to the data set. I do not have a pre registration available. And I'm just typing in words. Um, the license, um, based on the preprint provider, certain licenses are selectable. Um, some preprints require, as OSF does, that you either have an international or a universal um, license for the preprint you're, you're, for the article or content you're submitting. Then you select your discipline. Um, I'm just picking architecture for fun. Authors, you have the ability to keep. Um, whoever submitting has to be the uh, author, but I can also, let's say that um, my colleague was just working on this project with me, but didn't actually help in writing the content. I can remove them as an author on the paper. Um, I can add somebody else. So now um, Daniel is going to be a read-write permission for the preprint. I can continue. Did I have any conflicts of interest? That is up for you to decide. I'm just going to say no. Um, and then um, I can connect an existing OSF project. If you have the supplemental material like what you shared before, So now everything is filled out and you would just hit submit. Um, if you want to understand more about OSF preprints or OSF preprint moderation policies, you can click here. Um, here are some of the things that I went through um, with projects and their components. Like I said, studies one or two. Um, within those, you can also have things like hypotheses, data collection, protocol, 
um, various links to lab notebooks. Um, if you have, if you're collecting data specifically from, you know, different sources, like you might have PCR data, you might have um, microscopy data, uh, other types of data, you can always sort those out too. Um, we also have a bunch of templates that you can utilize um, that can be really helpful for helping you get started with setting up an OSF project. Um, I went through the preprints. Um, now we're gonna talk a little bit about relationships, connecting your resources across the OSF. Um, as I mentioned, you can link your ORC ID or sign in using your ORC ID, which means that anything you create or um, publish, any content that is public will automatically update to your ORCID account. Um, So when you start minting your DOIs, they will get um, a research organization uh, registry number, um, and then those will all be tagged together. That DOI will then carry your ORC ID and everything, and they're all connected through data site, the OSF, ORCID, your institution, um, allowing you to kind of make sure that um, your uh, identifiers are all connected and you take them with you wherever you go. Um, this is especially important um, when you're changing names or changing institutions or jobs to make sure that all of your content is kind of linked within one um, identifier that you can then make sure that you always have access to and reference to as you're moving forward. That felt really fast, I'm really sorry. Um, if you have any, if you need me help or have any more questions, um, we have a bunch of video references. We have a link to our support center. Um, there's a whole bunch of tips and tricks that we try to send out on a monthly basis. Um, you can always email in support at osf.io. Um, any other webinars and events that are upcoming. Um, and then uh, there's also organizational partnerships if you wanna discuss. Uh, as always, don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have questions, um, feature requests, if there's anything you're struggling with on the OSF. Um, we're always looking for new ways to improve our platform, um, and we get the best ideas of how to do that through you. Um, and something new that's coming or that will be coming with the follow-up email is we have OSF office hours where you can um, schedule a 15-minute session with uh, COS staff who are knowledgeable in the use of the OSF and can help you with small problems or um, identifying better ways to do things or if you're struggling with something. Um, and these will be shared out, um, like I said, in the follow-up email along with the Google Doc that I dropped in the, that was dropped in the chat earlier and these slides um, and a recording. So, I'm gonna stop sharing and see that it was. Um, okay, all right. Um, let's see, Felipe, if you wanna do a pre-registration of a study that is part of a bigger project, but the bigger project will only be added later by someone else. Um, so right now with you can always create a pre-registration and then it won't, um, it'll create a project when you create it. And you can always just start with the pre-registration. Uh, oh, actually Daniel's answering that. Let's see, Georgios, and if I'm, if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, I'm very sorry. Um, you're not finding the newsletter you receive very helpful. Um, it's full of resources, but where do you start? Um, I can share screen real quick. So I think we've started. We just sent out a just sent out a new tips and tricks um, for our support center. So um, right here, getting started. <laughs> um, so this is a really good, a really useful resource for getting started on the OSF. Um, first time using it. Um, recordings, getting started for research groups, 
Um, there's also, I think our tips and tricks that um, maybe just worn out, but yeah, first getting started homepage, uh, first time using the OSF is usually, does that answer your question, Georgios? Okay, excellent. And within this, there's also links to like the templates that I mentioned that are really useful. Okay, good. I'm glad. <laughs> I always feel bad about pronouncing names when I just see them written. Okay. Um, oh gosh, I feel really weird finishing this early. If there's any other questions, I'll stop sharing again real quick. I mean, I might be able to just answer that question out loud. Okay. Because um, I'm, I'm typing, but if you're going to end early, it might as well just talk out loud. Um, so I guess the question was, if you are pre-registering a study um, that's part of a bigger project, but you haven't really fleshed out that bigger project yet, you're not ready to pre-register that, what can you do? Um, so in that case, uh, there's a couple of different ways that you can link it. Uh, my initial reaction, uh, first off, it's a very good question. It's an interesting way of kind of thinking about things. But uh, my initial way of thinking about it would be to create an OSF project for that larger overarching project first. Uh, you start by kind of creating you know, that large overarching project, and it does not have to be filled out. You keep it private, uh, but you can just have kind of a loose outline of what you're trying to do right in the description. Uh, but then from there, you can create a component where you really start to flesh out that pre-registration, that sub part of that project. Um, and then what you can do is from there, you can create a pre-registration based on a project, or in this case, your sub component. Um, again, you can keep your registrations embargoed and your uh, projects private, if that's what you choose. Um, but that gives you the flexibility of kind of creating a structure of what you want the project to look like, uh, creating that outline of what you want that whole project to look like, and then only pre-registering the parts of the project that you are ready to uh, kind of lock into place, which is the point of a pre-registration. Um, and then also by doing that, you are linking your, uh, you they will not create a new associated project. You are already creating that association between your registration and the OSF project that you have been filling out on your own. Uh, does that answer your question? Um, I'm happy to walk you through kind of an example of what that would look like, uh, maybe even in a one-on-one -on -one meeting if we want to do that. Okay, awesome. Um, we might have more here, Blaine, if you want to. Yeah, um, I was going to say, okay, so Fred and I guess Gretchen have been talking. I'm going to leave them. I also saw hiding um, the recent activity from your project. Um, that That is not an object. That is not an um, option. As long as your um, project is public, that's part of um, the OSF's uh, goal to enhance transparency. Um, it's also really good um, if you have other people that are working on your project and all of a sudden, let's say a file disappears or you need to see what a collaborator has done. That's what the recent activity is meant for. Um, I also, since I have time, I'm going to show you how you can easily connect an add-on within your profile um, since I had forgotten that I had already done that for mine. So I'm going to share screen real quick. Um, so if I want to connect my account, I'll use my COS account. And so now I've connected my Google Drive account. And then the same thing and this was all through, oh, yeah. So my, <laughs> my Zotero account uses my personal email. So then I log in there and that connects my Zotero account. Billy Blaine, speaking of Zotero, uh, somebody in the chat asked, in terms of Zotero, 
does it work with a group that was shared with you, but you are not the owner of that group? Do you have to know? No, I've only connected my private or my personal library. Um, I guess if you are, we could test that and get back to you. Cool. Unless Thanks, you know, Crystal. I, I've never um, attached Zotero to okay. OSF personally. Okay. Are there any other questions? I see there was a lot of Q and A answers. Anything? Yeah. Um, Blaine, I may have missed this. Have you talked about the new Cedar integration for metadata? I have not. I can share that real quick. So we um recently added a uh, Cedar metadata. Um, let's go to my projects. Oh, gosh. So if I go to my metadata fields, um, I can add, so CDAR is a, um, a resource that utilizes community metadata records. Um, as of right now, we have, I think, three or four available. Um, these are templates from CDAR. Um, there's like a psych, a human cognitive neuroscience, um, an OSF enhanced metadata, as well as an LD based project metadata form. Um, these have are, are for very specific um, communities that have very specific metadata requirements. Um, and so you can select any of these to then add additional uh, values. So um, with this, um, you can add contributors, you can add all these different locations, values, fields. Um, you can't publish it until it's fully completed. So I use this one. Um, any of the ones that have a red star are required. So this would be one. Um, values. Once all of the um, required fields are filled out. You can publish it. And now this is part of your uh, metadata record. And you can add additional community metadata uh, records if you wish. Um, if you are interested or you're part of a community that has a uh, metadata record with CDAR, um, reach out and we can always add that um, as the one of the options within um, the CDAR workbench that we connect to. Any other questions? Or since we still have time, is there anything else anyone wants to mention as part of my team that they want me to discuss? Oh, um, yeah, I see Crystal talking about linking projects as parts of components. Yes, we're going to, um, Howard, yes, we're going to send out the slides along with the document for the um, the descriptions of the things that I went through and did and the recording um, after the, um, with a follow-up email. Yep. Um, so we're now going to do one last thing, which is the closing poll. So I'm going to give everyone at least a couple minutes to do this. Well, thank you everyone for attending.